Welcome to another Dr. Sadler's Honest Book Review. The book that we have today is a fairly recent one called Why Cicero Matters by Vittorio Bufacci, and it's put up by Bloomsbury. It's part of their series, Why Philosophy Matters, which is supposed to be about why a particular philosopher, school, or thought of area of philosophical study really matters. And one of the things that's kind of cool about this that I'll mention before we jump into the review proper, each of these is accompanied by an ongoing series of free events in Bloomsbury. So, you know, that's kind of a neat uh, new add-on that we see happening here today. It's a little fairly short book, but we'll, we'll get into that in just a minute. We always begin these reviews by attending to three main S's, style, structure, and summary. So I'll mention style is very readable. It's aimed at a general, fairly well-educated audience, but I think that most people can readily make sense of this. It is an academic press and book, so you do see that it has uh, quite a few notes in the back, uh, some of which are rather substantive, many of which are providing you with reading suggestions. Uh, divide it up according to chapters. And then there's a bibliography as well that goes on for a number of pages uh, intended not just to provide you with information about Cicero, but also the Roman Republic and its decline into uh, an empire or tyranny, depending on how you look at it, as well as some other matters as well. And then, of course, it has an index. So that's kind of nice features that you find in academic works. It is well written, I would say, and um, it's a nice book for engaging the reader. It's set out in, you could say, a typical uh, chapter academic book style where there is a short preface and then there's a, you know, sort of, here's what we're going to do, here's the main problem, introduction, and we'll talk about what the main idea of the book is in just a moment. Uh, and then there are a number of chapters. The first chapter is devoted to Cicero Homo Philosophicus being opposed to Homo Economicus um, and, uh, you know, going into why Cicero is important, uh, what's going on. I should mention that the, the introductory chapter also talks about how Cicero doesn't get the attention that he used to get and should get by comparison to another big picture, um, you know, grand figure who is a contemporary of Cicero, which is Julius Caesar. People are fascinated with him. And part of the main idea of the book is eh, we shouldn't be looking at Caesar. We should be looking to Cicero instead. Um, Chapter one is you know, sort of setting the issues up and all of that. And then the chapters after that, the majority of them are centered around a book and a theme that we find in Cicero's works. So chapter two centers around Cicero's book on duties, important work of ethics, but also political literature. Chapter three is explicitly about uh, a political work on the Republic, which is a, a somewhat fragmentary work. We don't actually possess all of it. Um, chapter four is going to look at Cicero's on friendship and frame it not just in terms of intimate friendships, but also what we could call friendships between citizens and look at something that he's going to call cyber friendship. And then chapter five is on Cicero's on old age, which is an important topic for thinking about political communities and how we deal with um, the aged population. In chapter six, he's going to make the argument Rome needs philosophy. And Rome isn't just Rome or contemporary Rome. It's all of us in Western liberal democracies where there are some serious dangers. Finally, it's going to conclude with the epilogue. Why read Cicero today? Why Cicero is a thinker 
for the 20th century. And if you wanted to give a summary of the entire work, it would essentially be that we need to be looking at Cicero because of the dangers of our time. So I'll read you a little bit from uh, the introduction. He, he's going to tell us, the book that you're about to read is different from those listed above, which are you know more historical things. This book is not about understanding his, Cicero and his historical, intellectual, or philosophical context. I'm not trying to reconstruct the motivations of a historical figure who lived 2,000 years ago, as is the case, and he brings up a couple examples. Instead, this book is written from the point of view of the 21st century and the predicament we find ourselves in today. This book is for readers who, like me, are concerned about the current state of affairs in global politics, where authoritarian far-right populists are all rallying against the foundations of our democratic practice. What all far-right politicians have in common is a commitment to the political philosophy of Caesarism. And he says that, you know, there's resemblances. We shouldn't be too, you know, uh, mapping everything on to ancient Rome is contemporary, uh, whatever, for example, America. But he says there is one resemblance between the world and, of Cicero and our world today that cannot be overlooked. These are dangerous times. Modern democracy is still only a green shoot, right? Uh, in, in Europe, in the United States, democracy has allegedly been around for a little longer, although in the first hundred years or so it coexisted with slavery. Liberal democracy has been around a lot less than the Roman Republic. And being younger, it is perhaps also more fragile. Today, our modern democracies face their most daunting test in many years. So why Cicero then? So this is, again, summary. The ultimate goal in writing this book is to suggest a different way to think about political engagement today and how Cicero can help us realize this new political imaginary. This book is primarily a reflection on where philosophy overlaps with politics, though it wants to be much more than an analysis of an important historical figure in the distant history of Western philosophy. This book is also about the precarious state of democracy in the 21st century and how a philosopher wearing a toga in ancient Rome can lend us a hand to reinforce our republic. In the last analysis, this book wants to show that our world today needs a Cicero more than it needs yet another Julius Caesar. So that's, you know, a, a good set of points summarizing what's going on. I'll mention just one other uh, thing here. So Cicero, as uh, um, uh, Bufacci points out, is not a fashionable figure in contemporary political philosophy. Uh, and he gives some reasons why. And he says, I want to have a different reading of Cicero. He's not just a conservative. Uh, he's not a radical or forerunner to Karl Marx or revolutionary politics. But he could be drawn upon for anyone who wants to promote a more egalitarian progressive society, and for knowing how to protect and strengthen our democratic institutions. So he says, the aim of this book is to change our perception of Cicero and to offer a more progressive interpretation of Cicero's political thought. Notice this line, though. Even if this means sacrificing historical accuracy, I'm less interested in figuring out what were Cicero's true intentions when he took a certain political decision or wrote a speech or a political treatise. My goal is to apply the spirit of his ideas to our own historical context today, even if doing so requires taking some poetic license with the historical figure of Cicero. Does Cicero still speak to us today? I think he does, and we should listen to him. So I think that's an adequate summary drawn from the author's own words about what this book is about and moreover intended to do, the case that he's trying to make. So let's talk about what some of the key ideas or main points made in this book are. Obviously, we've already talked about a certain kind of advocacy that the author is engaging in. We need more Cicero's, less 
Caesars. The only way to do that is to actually like look at what Cicero himself put forward. He's going to be very useful for our own time. And you could say that he's sort of undervalued stock is the argument here. Um, it begins uh, in, you know, once we get to the, the sort of root of the work in chapter one, in this contrast between Cicero being posed as homo philosophicus, a philosophical human being, and uh, homo econ economicus, um, economic man, uh, who is motivated primarily by self-interest equated to an overwhelming, awe-inspiring desire to maximize our wealth. And this is going to be used and appealed to throughout uh, this work, which, you know, is, is tying into um, threats to democracy. One of those big threats is going to be corruption. And you could say certainly Homo economicus is going to be very interested in corruption because they want to engage in it if they can, and they're not going to think about the longer term consequences. But we can also ask, why do people want demagogues? Why do people want tough guy tyrants? Why do people want Caesars? And so that's going to be a question of the book. Um, Cicero's writings are viewed as being pertinent to the 21st century and not just in a self helpy you know you can be more productive at work you can make your relationships better you can have less anxiety sort of way as often happens with philosophical figures i mean there are works of cicero that might lend themselves better to that for example the tusculan disputations Instead, the author is thinking in explicitly political frameworks and saying Cicero can help us think out really important, pressing philosophical issue, or philosophical and political issues, fundamental issues in how we live together, who we allow to be in charge, how we structure things. He, his texts contain... Um, wisdom, arguments, distinctions that would be really helpful for us in the present day. Um, there's other aspects of it that I think you can tie in with the particular chapters. So chapter two, which is about Cicero's on duties, virtue ethics, right? That is what Cicero is endorsing and telling us why we need certain virtues, why they're rooted in genuine human nature, how not cultivating them or cultivating the opposite vices is stifling human nature and that it has political consequences. Um, civic republicanism is an idea that is being endorsed here. And I'll actually, since people might get a little confused about that, I do want to read a little proviso that the, that chapter begins with. Civic republicanism is one of the hottest political ideas in contemporary political philosophy. This has nothing to do with the Republican Party in the United States. The political philosophy of civic republicanism is a very old idea that goes back to ancient Greece and ancient Rome. Thus, it predates American politics and the politics of liberalism and neoliberalism by many centuries. The revival of this old tradition in the last two decades is one of the most exciting developments in political philosophy, especially as it poses a strong challenge to the hegemony of liberalism. So he's going to explore that in this uh, third chapter. Then we get to uh, discussions of friendship and why friendship is important. He talks about personal friendship. Then he talks about civic friendship. And this is quite important. Um, something that comes up within the entire earlier political tradition with Plato and Aristotle and others, but is really stressed by Cicero. Um, and then there's a nice discussion about cyber friendship or friendship in an online environment and whether it's possible, what it's doing to us and what its uh, implications are for our political decisions and our system. Chapter five about growing old, um, you know, as I mentioned, is, is uh, going to be looking at, well, what should we think about aging and old people as involving? Are they to be just pushed aside, hidden away, used as resources, treated badly, or 
should we be valuing them, trying to draw upon what it is that they still have to offer uh, within, you know, reason, don't, don't want to stress them too much. And what does Cicero actually have to tell us about old age? And, you know, what are the implications for our society and how we treat older people? So those are some really important points. Um, I think that, you know, you can say there's a constant drumbeat that Cicero is an undervalued and overlooked resource. Um, he gives you some explanation of why this is the case. We mentioned, um, you know, a certain kind of view of Cicero being a conservative uh, earlier. And he says, so Cicero is not a fashionable figure. This, perhaps this is because for many centuries he was admired principally for his work on rhetoric, a skill no longer taught in school or valued in society. When it wasn't rhetoric, historically, Cicero was admired for advocating the law of nature as if he were a precursor of Thomism and Christian philosophy. When natural law lost its grip on moral philosophy, Cicero's political philosophy was gradually marginalized and forgotten. And so, you know, very often Cicero is associated with a certain kind of old-fashioned conservatism that really isn't the conservatism that people in the present on the right call conservatism because they... This is a bit of a side note. They didn't manage to conserve their idea of conservatism, you know, not even remotely like even Reaganist conservatism, so uh, which was rather innovative at the time. Um, the other thing that I, I would say is really quite interesting, he's making a case that modern democracies are really in danger in the present. And he's, he's saying this in a number of places in the work. Here's, here's one um, good example. So he says the chief enemy of modern democracies is an amalgam of authoritarianism and populism. This menace would have been very familiar to Cicero, which is why we have a lot to learn from his political theory. And he, he points out, you know, uh, the number of countries moving in an authoritarian direction in 2020 outnumbered those going in a democratic direction. This includes established democracies like the United States, but also EU member states, including Hungary, Poland, and Slovenia. At least four democracies have disappeared in the last two years, replaced by authoritarian regimes, either through flawed elections or military coups. So yeah, this is a real significant problem, isn't it? And he, he talks a little bit later about uh, one big aspect of this. He says, in the, this is in the epilogue, in the 21st century, the refugee and migrant crisis has become perhaps the most, most divisive and disturbing global political reality. States and continents are turning into fortresses, doing their worst to deny citizenship to refugees. It may surprise some readers to find that Cicero was in favor of extending citizenship, not restricting it, since he recognized this was in the interest of the Roman Republic. And he says, there are three political questions where Cicero can still speak to us. The advance of far-right populism, the corrosive nature of corruption, and our abdication of our duties as citizens. So on those three points, in terms of politics and culture, um, Bufacci views Cicero, I think quite rightly, as having a lot to contribute to our 21st century understandings of how to deal with these perennial problems. So that, that's uh, quite interesting as well. Um, and I would say, you know, there we're kind of summarizing what the key points are. I mean, one key point that you could say gets made over and over again is look at how good Cicero uh, treats this thing. We can take some tools, some ideas from that and bring Cicero into conversation with our 21st century dialogues and discussions and even polemics about these matters. All right, what's good about this work? What good features does it have that would recommend it to you and make you perhaps want to purchase it or get a copy of it at your local library? Uh, you know, I, I think that it largely achieves its main goal, which is to position and advocate for Cicero as a thinker for our present day circumstances, who, because of his own times and his own thought and the resources within his work, has plenty to contribute to us if we're going to spend the time to read him. 
Um, I think that it's also got decent discussions of Cicero's historical situation, of the political issues, and his political theory. Um, I think that it does a good job in placing him in there without trying to go into, uh, you know, a lot of depth. And, and you know, uh, Bufacci tells you, as I, I mentioned just a little bit earlier, I'm not going to try to do what these other authors are doing with Cicero in much longer studies about his historical situation. I'll just give you sort of an overview of that. And I think that on the whole, it is a well-researched book. You can find this in the notes and the bibliography. You know, it's uh, well indexed. So these are things that you expect out of something that is coming from an academic press, even though it's a you know relatively short book, uh, 175 pages total, including all the rest. It's it's got actually the the main body of the work is uh, a little over 140 pages. So um, it's well written. I think that, you know, if you read it, you'll enjoy reading it. And that's something to recommend it. It's got a very good debunking of this Caesar fellow who, you know, all too often is presented as if he's the good guy. And we forget the fact that he chose to deliberately commit genocide, that he plunged the Republic into civil war, that he became an authoritarian and set the Republic, which was certainly in deep trouble, on a path that led to uh, tyranny of, of a sort, not a more stable configuration, even though it worked out that way occasionally. And, you know, there's a good rehabilitation of somebody who's often turned into the villain, Brutus, and Cicero himself. So that, that's good, I would say. Um, I also, you know, like the uh, discussion of cyber friendship, which is rather short. I mean, you could actually write an entire book about that, I think, but it's, it's quite good. Uh, and here's like a little bit of this, right? Cicero would probably say that the social media universe can be a good thing if used properly and terribly harmful to the soul, if not, right? And, you know, then he, he says, well, I'm not, as the author, I'm not convinced. Um, social media platforms like Facebook are not conducive to the search for truth. So he's, he's, you know, saying, here's what Cicero would say. Here's my own critical take on that. And, uh, you know, it goes into a little bit of discussion about that that I quite like. Um, there's a, I, I like the emphasis, at, at least partial emphasis that's there on the issue of old age. What are we going to do with an aging population who themselves are sometimes contributing to this problem of authoritarianism and the withdrawal of citizens from any sort of really, you know, good engaged intergenerational politics? What are we going to do with them? This poses some real issues. And I, I will say, too, it's good that Bufacci is not idolizing or idealizing Cicero. He's got, you know, some criticisms, including uh, a, a, a part of it called Cicero's failings, right? He says, I've done my best to restore the reputation of Cicero as a significant figure, but um, this doesn't mean Cicero was faultless or that his political vision was beyond criticism. There's no doubt that he had considerable blind spots, um, and, you know, he talks about the condition of the masses and um, being an inegalitarian of, of certain sorts. So, you know, these are quite important. He also says because he was not a military man, Cicero failed to understand something really important, that the most powerful class in Rome at the end of the Republic were the Roman soldiers, the often neglected underclass of Roman society. Um, and then he he ends by talking about this death by witticism that Cicero couldn't resist making jokes. And that's part of what actually got him killed. So a certain imprudence or intemperance there. So I, I think that's good that he's not hero worshiping Cicero the way that so many people hero worship the big man like, like you know, Caesar, uh, these, these uh, authoritarian types. Um, and he's got some discussions about how we can resist the decline of democracies. Um, you know, he, he says that 
if we want to keep hold of our democratic institutions, if we want to stop authoritarianism from taking over, we could do a lot worse than to read, reread, and learn from Cicero. There are many important principles and ideas we can uncover or rediscover from reading Cicero's books, speeches, and letters. Um, and then there is the love of philosophy and how important that is. So I think these are all some good features of the work that are worth highlighting. There are some features of this work that I think are problematic, and I'll, I'll break them into a couple different categories. So one of them, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later, is it, there's just not enough, right? Um, it needs to be, I would say, a longer book in order to do the job that it was supposed to do, unless the goal is just to get people reading Cicero. So there's that part, the, let's call it not enough or inadequacies, too thin sort of criticisms. And then there's um, actually getting things wrong in ways that can be a little bit misleading or distracting. Um, and I think many of these could have could have been avoided. So, you know, some of these are more egregious than others. Let me begin with one that I I don't like that I see in a lot of authors. So in order to build Cicero up, we don't need to tear legitimate other philosophers down. And I think it's always a mistake to do that. So he, he'll say, for example, um, other contenders for the title of undisputed best philosopher in politics would include Seneca and Marcus Aurelius. Seneca's philosophical work is impressive, but he never held an elected position. Even though his political advisor to Nero, he had considerable influence. OK, so that's acknowledging that Seneca, you know, has a lot to offer. Doesn't say a word about that afterwards. Marcus Aurelius, et cetera, et cetera, does not engage systematically with any text in the history of philosophy. Instead, he's happy to dish out his pearls of wisdom devoid of any critical analysis. Well, that's not true. If you've actually read the meditations, devoid of critical analysis, I, I think that's going too far. And then there's a discussion of Plato and Aristotle in um, defining friendship, right? And here we go. Plato and Aristotle both struggled to come up with definitions of friendship, which is an indication of how difficult it is to get a hold of this concept. Okay, so Plato certainly did in Lysias, but there's other discussions, right? Aristotle didn't struggle to come up with a definition of friendship. And if you've actually read the Nicomachean Ethics, not book eight, but book nine, you know that he provided one, right? In his famous discussion of, can you actually be friends with himself? He says, here's the traits of what friendship is. Here's why somebody can be friends with himself. So this is a sign of not adequately engaging um, the literature that's out there. You know, he ends up saying the tripartite analysis doesn't add up to a definition of friendship, though there appears to be a common denominator across the three types of friendship singled out by Aristotle, you know, reciprocal loving. Aristotle says way more than that. And so this is a sign of somebody not knowing their Aristotle and not attending to it. So either, I mean, it makes one kind of impression. Either the author does actually understand that Aristotle did manage to define friendship and did so in his works and then overlooks it and, and you know tries to pretend as if it's not the case so cicero looks better that's not good or the author is ignorant of what aristotle actually taught and thought about friendship by the way also in the eudamian ethics that's a problem too because you shouldn't you probably shouldn't be opining about people in a book if you don't actually know what you're talking about so that's a problem. There's other things kind of like that, you know, and I, I suspect that some of this has to do with not a, adequately attending to the texts. So in the, the discussion of on duty, um, 
Bufacci tells us the text is divided into three books. The first book centers around the idea of honor, which at the time of Cicero was closely related to ethics, and its four major foundations, the search for truth, the maintenance of social relations, fortitude, and decorum. The second book explores the idea of utility, while the third book considers the clash between honor, parentheses, morality, and utility. So this is actually wrong. It's not honor, it's the honestum. Integrity is a better way to translate it, because honor is already a word, honor, or all the other things, the synonyms that are used for it, which is not a genuine good, definitely not the honestum in Cicero's On Duties. And if you've ever read Cicero's On Duties book two, it isn't just about the useful. He talks about the virtues in that book as well, giving you considerable analysis of them. So he's taking this from a very attenuated and I would say kind of shallow reading of on duties. That's, that's a problem. Um, he also says quite strangely, I'm not sure where this is coming from, um, that, you know, he leans towards Epicurean doctrines on other issues, right? Um, and if there's anybody who, who Cicero criticized the most, it's the Epicureans. So now he does mention, you know, approaching death in an Epicurean way, but he, he's not Seneca who's like, hey, if the Epicureans said something good, let's take that from them. So I, you know, that, that's a little suspicious to me. Um, he also claims that Cicero's approach to truth is pragmatism. Um, and he says that, um, here we go, that Cicero could be the intellectual predecessor, making him the first non-American pragmatist. Pragmatism as a defining position on the nature of truth, namely that there's no external truths, no absolute facts that exist independent of human experience. For a pragmatist, truth does not correspond with a objective reality. Truth is what coheres with particular systems of belief. And he says that, um, you know, this is pointed out by Alan Ryan, where Plato sees us pulled towards the depth of philosophical truth. Cicero embeds us in concentric circles of social connections. So he's just basically quote dropping there. Cicero isn't a pragmatist. I think if you read the Academica, you're not going to come away with that idea um, of it. And, and, and I, don't need, I don't think that needed to be in there. It's kind of misleading. Um, there is a mistranslation. It's, this is a bit of a quibble, but it's important to get things right, especially if you're going to claim that Cicero is about the truth. So Cicero famously said, Sina amicitia vita essa nolum. Here's what, what Bufacci says. This translates as life without friends is simply not worth living. That's not what it translates as. It translates as life without friendship, amicitia, right, is not worth living, right? Or literally is nothing, vita essa nullum. So I don't, I don't know that the author actually looks at the original text or translates well from Latin. It seems a little fast and loose to me. Um, there's also kind of a conflation early on in the book, a claim here that maybe is, is wrong. So he says, contrary to what may seem and even contrary to what Cicero apparently said, with Cicero, it is impossible to distinguish philosophy from politics. Cicero's engagement with politics was philosophy in action and his philosophy was politics in theory. This just seems wrong to me. I mean, and, and you know, Bufacci says, contrary to what Cicero apparently said. No, it's not what Cicero apparently said. It's what Cicero actually literally said. So... Cicero sure as hell didn't think that philosophy and politics are the same thing. That, that, that just seems wrong. Why would you conflate those, those things? Again, I, I think that's you know, taking us astray. Now, the omissions of the book. So as I mentioned, this is a rather short book, right? And for making the case that it needs to make, I don't think that a hundred and... 
40 odd pages along with, okay, 10 pages, not even 10 pages of, of preface, uh, because the preface actually begins on page, um, page eight. Um, so less than 150 pages. It's not enough. Um, and I'll give you some, some reasons why. So there's four chapters, right? One on each of these books. Each of those really needed way more discussion of what's going on in the texts and why it's important. And I'll, I'll give you just a prime example. So on duties, really massively important work. As a matter of fact, the, the author says this is probably um, the most important of these, these works. One central text, he, he calls it. So everything here is drawn from book one of three books. I, I think the author doesn't actually know what book two and book three contain. That's a problem. But it doesn't even cover much of what's in book one because book one deals with four cardinal virtues, which would seem to be important to politics. So there's discussion of wisdom, great, the search for truth. There's discussion of justice, absolutely important, of course, right? But courage and temperance are also discussed in On Duties, in book one. So where are they in this text? They're mentioned, but never examined. And that's, that's a failing, I think. Um, you know, I'm not going to talk so much about the On the Republic because that's a fragmentary work, right? Um, although the chapter is pretty short, the, the book on the value of friendship, the chapter on the value of friendship, so uh, 79 to 93. So we're talking about less than 15 pages. There's so much involved. For example, the issue. If a friend wants you to do something wrong for them because you have this like reciprocity that you've built between the two of you, should you do it? Friendship seems like it should demand that. Not discussed in here. Absolutely important for political purposes, right? Um, on old age. Uh, it's That chapter, I think, is even shorter. So it begins on page 95 and finishes on page... 107, so 12 pages of text there. Again, not really enough. So the book is good for introducing people to Cicero and saying, hey, you might check this guy out, but it's not doing what you would expect it to be doing based on the claims of the author, that we're going to look at why each of these texts is important. And so I, I found it, you know, lacking. In, in that sense. It probably needed to be a longer text. Now, Bloom, Bloomsbury probably wanted a nice short text like this. Perhaps there were things that uh, the editors took out or um, you know, decided needed to be cut or minimized. Uh, in that case, they made a lesser work as a result. So those are my criticisms of the work. All right, so on the whole, I'm going to give this a qualified endorsement. I like where the book is coming from. I like the general thesis of the book that we really ought to be going back to Cicero, um, that he does have things to offer us in terms of the political and social situation of our times, not just in terms of individual ethics and relationships, but in terms of our society. I think it's it's an argument that really deserves to be made. And I think that when he's focused on making that argument that Bufacci is doing pretty good work, it does have some problems, I think. And you definitely wouldn't want to take this as like the last word or even necessarily as the second or third word on Cicero. But as a first word, I think this could be quite good. And so, you know, it's... Uh, it's worth checking out, I'll say. So you got a qualified endorsement there, and that's what we'll end with with this book, Why Cicero Matters by Vittorio Bufacci.